Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of Let's Talk Astrology. Today, I am privileged to be joined by highly esteemed astrologer, author, and lecturer, and leader in astrology, Anthony Lewis. So thank you so much for joining us today, and how are you doing? Doing well. My pleasure to be here. Wonderful. I, I said before the recording, I can't tell you how excited I am for today's presentation. So we're going to be talking about the secrets of predictive astrology, and this is based on your latest book, and the works of William Franklin. Now, William Franklin is a, is a lesser known early 20th century astrologer, and you've put together a brilliant presentation, so let's dive in. Okay, I, to, to clarify, you mentioned earlier you'd been, done some research on William Franklin and his life. If you do that, you'll find that there, in the United States, is a con artist who used the name William Franklin and pretended to be an astrologer to rip people off. That's not who we're talking about. <laughs> you know, I was going to ask you that actually before the recording, because yeah. I did pull up an article. And I was thinking William yeah. Franklin, who went by an alias and ended up swindling a bunch of people from their money. And uh, but then I, mm -hmm. I figured out intuitively, I'm like, I don't think this is the same person. <laughs> no, William Franklin was a very well-known, distinguished astrologer in London, practiced primarily in the 1920s and 30s. And my guess is this con artist in the United States just found Franklin's name somewhere and used it <laughs> to uh, rip people off. So if anyone does a bit of research, it's not the con artist who was in the United States, just to clarify. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's talk about William Franklin. Well, let me say this. I first found out about William Franklin in, maybe in the early, mid-1990s, reading uh, Jeffrey Cornelius's book on the moment of astrology, astrology, and he mentions William Franklin as being one of the leading horror astrologers in England in the 1920s, and he gives the example of the horror, which I'm going to talk a little bit about, and I was so captivated by that, I said to myself, I have to learn more about this guy, William Franklin. And it wasn't until COVID, and I had a lot more time <laughs> at home, <laughs> that I said, well, now I have more free time. I'm going to get his books and, and learn what he had to say. Wonderful. Okay. So this is my current book, which is basically my description, or my reaction to reading Franklin and thinking, this guy is wonderful, and I wish his techniques were better known, and so I wrote it up, put several examples, and this is the product. And I will say I have it right here, and it is a must-read. Uh, do certainly put it towards your collection for anyone mm -hmm. watching this. I'll put links in the description as well. Wonderful. So this is William Franklin's first book, uh, written in 1926. He'd been practicing in London maybe for the, a decade earlier, since kind of the end of World War I. And he had grown frustrated with what were known of traditional techniques at that time. Obviously, they didn't have the volume now we have of all these translated texts. And what he was finding was he had a very busy consulting practice and that frequently he would find some major direction or progression and nothing would happen in the life of a client. Or conversely, uh, something major would happen in the life of a client and he couldn't find a reason for it based on the tradition that he learned so far. So he thought there must be something missing and I'm going to look for it. And he began doing research on charts using what came to be called symbolic directions. I'm not sure when that term got coined. I know he actually, Charles Carter wrote a book on symbolic directions that came out in 1929, mm. which was largely in reaction to Franklin's work. I mean, that's how influential he was. And Franklin discovered a number of symbolic techniques, which he thought in his experience worked pretty well much of the time. They weren't a hundred percent, but they were, they really added a lot to his um, armamentarium. And, and Carter was prominent in his own right, wasn't he? Wasn't he the one who famously predicted the year of his own death? 
I think at, at sixty. Uh, he he may, I don't recall that. It's possible. I don't, I don't remember. Yeah. But he Carter was a leading astrologer in in England in London at the time. I, I believe it was the um, the London Lodge or the astrology. I'm yeah, I think words, the astrological yeah. lodge. Yeah, and he he was connected with Alan Leo and the major astrologers in London all met together. Franklin was one of them. Uh, they knew each other and influenced each other. Uh, so this this is his first book probably the most important. He has, he has three books. The first two are very important. And the, the third one he wrote in the early, published in the early 1930s. And it's, it's less meaty. It's, it's probably worth reading, but it's less so. Okay. So I was interested in Franklin as a horror astrologer. Uh, and this is the quote from Jeffrey Cornelius. I'm going to move our faces off the screen a bit. In the moment of astrology, 1994. So that's when I first got acquainted with Franklin. This is a direct quote. Cornelius writes, Franklin's work deserves to be better known. He was known to an earlier generation of English astrologers for his pioneering development of symbolic directions, which much influenced Charles Carter in the late 1920s. He was a full-time consultant astrologer with an office in the West End of London, and a thriving practice in the period between the wars, World War I, World War II. He was one of the very few gifted horror astrologers of the period. Uh, he briefly achieved public prominence in 1926, when a detailed account of one of his horror judgments appeared in the London Evening News. It didn't, it wasn't just the London, but it appeared in several newspapers throughout Britain at the time. Mm. And the story was, and I'll show the chart, uh, he had grown up in, is it Burnley? Was it? Burnley, uh, yeah, yeah. Burnley, yeah. and moved to London uh, mm. when he was an adult uh, to pursue his astrology. But he knew people back home, and one of the women he knew contacted him in 1926 because her father, who had had to stop working and was suffering from a significant depression, uh, had disappeared. He just went left the house in the middle of the night and couldn't be found. And the family looked, the police looked for a couple of days, no trace of him. And this woman said, well, I know this astrologer in London. He does this kind of work. I'll contact him. She contacted him. He asked her for her father's birth data, which I don't have. Uh, and he did a chart for the moment he got the question in London. And he wrote back to her and said, unfortunately, I'm paraphrasing, uh, based on your father's birth chart and the horror chart, I things don't look good. I think he probably is dead. And here is where I think you'll find him. It looks to me like he drowned. And he, I guess there were, he knew there were canals going through town because he grew up there. His body is probably in one of these waterways in a certain direction from your house. And so the woman gave this, these instructions to her husband who followed them and ended up finding the body. And then there was a coroner's uh, investigation of meeting. I guess the police found were a bit incredulous. <laughs> they, but th they ended up, you know, not um, pressing any charges against the woman and her husband. Because you think in that time of in, in time of day when you've got the police looking for a body, and then you've got this this astrologer, and of course. Um, you know, we also we all know the attacks on astrology, but yeah, you've got someone coming in saying this is exactly or more or less where the body is. So the police are thinking, well, this guy, how does this guy know? Is he a part? Is he a suspect in this in this particular? Uh, right. Well, it was clear the astrologer wasn't because he was in London, uh, quite quite a distance away. But I think they were suspicious that the woman's husband, the daughter's husband, oh, is the husband who wow. found the body. Like, how did you go directly to the body when the police had been searching all weekend and couldn't find him? So I got that wrong. So it wasn't the it wasn't William Franklin the suspicious of the of the husband because they knew where to go more or less 
and and find the body. That's right. That's so Franklin sent them directions. Look here. Ah. The woman's husband followed the directions and ended up finding the body. After so the, police, the police, so the police are saying to themselves, "How on earth has this, you know, the 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 husband of the wife of the father who's gone and found the body that it, it brings up suspicions? It must have done. That's that's so fascinating." Yeah. But I guess the press were at this coroner's meeting and wrote it up in the local papers. It got picked up in the London papers, and Franklin became quite. He had his moment of fame in 1926. Incredible. Um, and in Jeffrey Cornelius in his book gives a detailed account of this. It's 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 a wonderful thing to read. <clears throat> um, so here, oh, Franklin's birth chart. I couldn't find um, a source for Franklin's birth information, but he describes his chart in several places in his various books. So I put all that together and concluded he was born September 26th, 1878, based on his description of his birth chart, probably at 426 in the morning, give or take a minute or two, uh, in or near Burnley. And so this is my best approximation of his chart. Working off this chart, it just strikes me, number one, how strong that mercury is. And if this is indeed within a few minutes, we've got Mercury that is the chart ruler, is domicile, is you know, conjunct the ascendant, rule in the midheaven. I think you've mentioned here you've got Venus in its terms, or the rule in that ninth as well. So such a fascinating mm -hmm. um uh, chart to look at. Interestingly, as well, I was when I was speaking to Bernadette Brady in terms of she thinks more often than not, astrologers have a lot of planets in detriment and fall. And anyway, that's just something that came to mind when talking about astrologers more than the average yogi bear, I think she said having um, views or or doing things that go against the grain of society or just different ways of doing things. So anyway, those are some of the things that struck me mm -hmm. as you put this chart together. And a lot of Virgo in this chart. Mm -hmm. I recall, I think it was Lee Lehman once told me, most of the horror astrologers she knows have a lot of Virgo in their charts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder as well with William Franklin being, uh, I, I believe, I think from your book, quite a uh, not only an accurate, but quite a detailed, accurate descriptions of, mm -hmm. um, you know, where, especially that case of where the body's found and obviously is very prominent practice in London. So having that, that mutable earth energy and those st strong mercury as well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, so you, a point that Jeffrey Cornelius makes is that Franklin was using the traditional compass directions associated with signs and houses and that, in fact, he, he sort of got it wrong. <laughs> I think he said southwest and it should have been northeast or something. I don't, that's, I don't really exactly. And so um, Cornelius used this as an argument for the, the horary daimon being present, that it isn't sufficient just to have the chart. There's something else going on guiding the person. Um, so it's, it's worth reading Cornelius's book. I can't do justice to it. Yeah, I love that point of, of the diamond. So even if, if technically there was a mistake made, it somehow there's something else going on that actually leads to the correct location or the correct place. So that's such a right. fascinating philosophical take, I think, as well. Yeah, I think, I think I'd have to look it up. I think Cornelius's point was there was a mistake made if you mm. use traditional horror literature, but... The mistake is what allowed the husband of the woman to go directly to the body. Ah, incredible. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. This is just a little summary of Franklin. First book in 1926. So oh, I made a note here. This 1926 must have been an amazing year in astrology in London. <laughs> This is the same year that Safariel's Geodetic Equivalence book came out. <clears throat> and I think that's significant because Fra I, I believe, but Franklin doesn't say it, that Franklin and some of the other British astrologers must have been learning about what was going on in Hamburg, Germany with Alfred Witte and what now we call Uranian astrology because Franklin especially mentions many times the importance of the vernal point, the zero Aries, mm. the importance of studying midpoints, 
And Safari will basically takes zero Aries and says, we can use that, map that onto the uh, prime meridian that goes through Greenwich and make geodetic equivalents to the zodiac around the globe. So that there's this idea of the importance of you know, the vernal point that seems to peak in 1926 in England. Interesting to look yeah. back and see what was going on. And I believe it's the year that Queen Elizabeth was born. So if you're just thinking about her oh, charts, yeah. maybe some interesting uh, transits going yeah. on at that time. Very, very interesting. You know, and this this horary that made Franklin famous was in 1926. It's ah. it, it was a very interesting year. So he published a second book in 28 and then a third book in 1930. And, and he, he had, I think, published a number of articles in astrological journals as well. Uh, but his two key texts are the, the first two. And they are what inspired Charles Carter, whom he knew personally, because he uses Charles Carter's chart in one of his books, doesn't identify Carter, but shows how details of Carter's life fit with his symbolic directions that he was experimenting with. Um, and I said, he didn't mention Alfred Witte or the Hamburg School, but I'm kind of convinced he must have been familiar somewhat with what they were doing mm. and experimenting. Because Witte was also using new measures, which is what uh, Franklin called his techniques. Because were, were midpoints not extensively used in that time period, particularly in England? Would no, they, they weren't. Right. They weren't. In fact, I tried to find the first time midpoints were mentioned in Carter's work because he was so influential in that period. I can't remember. I think it's in his book where he gives a bunch of definitions of astrological terms. And there's a little footnote that mentions, oh, there are these things called midpoints. Maybe they're important. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember which year he published that, but um, and he was right; they are important. But he gives he puts them in a footnote as kind of an afterthought. But yeah, okay. So th this is a story we've gone over. the um, The Burnley man Edward Whitehead went missing. He'd been out of work, home depressed, um, distraught, left. He apparently left the house like at four in the morning. Everybody was sleeping. The family discovered him gone in the morning. And I think it was on a Friday because I think they spent the weekend searching for him. And then the daughter contacted Franklin after a couple of days. Uh, this is a quote from Franklin's horror reading. There was probably death by water in a stream or canal south or a little west. And I think this was off because... The, the body was found north and east instead of south and west, or maybe it was north and west. But uh, but the husband apparently had been trying to find um, the missing man, found his slipper, so that no body but the slippers of the man, huh. and then went, I think, southwest of where the slippers were and found the body. Oh, wow. Wow. So, uh, you know, that's my recollection. I'd have to look it up to be certain. Yeah. Uh, not exactly near your home, but at no great distance, in a place where there are sheds, tools, and boats, and is rather barren. And so these are the instructions the husband's following that led to the body. And made the police suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> this is the horror chart. Um the the woman the querent is the first house represented by Leo and the sun, her father. It's a question: Where is my father? Fourth house, Scorpio. So Mars is the significant of the fourth cusp, and Saturn is in the fourth in Scorpio. And so Franklin says Saturn and watery Scorpio in the fourth, and it's square to Neptune, watery Neptune, very closely square. Mm. And Franklin says that means he probably died dr drowned. And, and um, it's quite interesting, even bringing in water. I think six out of the ten bodies here are in water, as mm -hmm. a, as, a, as a combination. You've, as you've said here, you've got that Neptune um, ruling the the cusp of the eighth as well, and all these different factors and the barrenness. Mm -hmm. 
of the location. Really, really fascinating. Right. And he's clearly using modern rulers, which traditionalists would not use. Hmm. Right. And Neptune, modern ruler of the eighth of death. Fourth ruler, Mars. So the fourth Mars is the father of by cusp rulership, is in Capricorn, indicating a southern direction. Okay. But in fact, he was more north than south. It's in a succident house, so he's not too far. The Intori angular is close, succulent, succident's a little further, and mm. cadent is far away. On the It's on the western side of the chart, so Franklin says, look to the west of where you live. The 12th ruler moon opposes Mars. And that's really quite tight. We're only, what, about um, 26, 27 minutes applying. So that's, right. you, you couldn't get any closer. Yeah. And it's, again, it's water. Moon mm -hmm. in Pisces, you can't get waterier than that. <laughs> And the moon is in the 11th, which is the derived eighth of the father. Father is four. Father's seventh is 10. Father's eighth is 11. So the moon is opposing the father significator from the house of death of the father. Uh, he says it's probably a gloomy, barren, commercial, work-related place because of the Capricorn influence. And he looked at the father's natal chart, which I don't have. Uh, but he describes it as in the natal chart, he directs the sun, meaning secondary progression, uh, and it's square to natal Saturn. So Just, it brings well, up that, that element of what you were saying before in the story, that element of depression, maybe in that sense of uh, diminished yeah. vitality. And um, I, I wonder what the story was. Maybe he lost his job or I, I'm not sure. Uh, well, he did lose his job. I think probably what happened is that he became clinically depressed and lost his job. I, th I think that was probably the sequence from what I read of the story, but I don't know for sure. Mm. And then he was just home depressed, doing nothing, and became quite suicidal. So Franklin commented in 26, so he's describing his research. For more than 12 years, he had used primary directions and secondary progressions in his predictive work, but found that often significant directions and progressions occurred that did not manifest in the life or significant events occurs for which there were no corresponding primary directions or secondary progressions in the birth chart. So, so he began to look at what came to be called symbolic directions. In 26, oh no, this should be 29, this is a mistake. Carter's book came out in 29, not 26. 26 is Franklin's book. Carter defines symbolic systems of progressions as those which, in which the directional factors are progressed according to measures not based on astronomical motion, real or apparent. It's mm -hmm. purely symbolic measures. A classic example of a symbolic measure direction would be annual perfections. You just move the chart 30 degrees a year, one sign a year. That's not an astronomical measure. It's a symbolic measure. Mm. And such symbolic measures are often used together with real-time measures such as solar returns. Where is your son on your birthday that year? It's a real-time astronomical measure. Mm. And the combination of the two, symbolic plus real-time, are used to make predictions. Uh, and Franklin found that in his work, if you combine a symbolic measure with a real-time measure, you get the most reliable results. And, and this seems to be the argument from the book. And if you go back, if we were talking about the previous slide way, it seems like it was either hit or miss with the, the directions of the progression. So it seems like the argument here is using operative influences, but it has to be in combination with the symbolic measures in order to have, I think you say in the book, a ripened part of the chart. If you're looking out of the chart with a wider lens, looking at the forest, then going in for the trees, mm -hmm. you have to have these combinations in order for maybe more likely for an event to transpire rather than just having the, the triggering or operative influences. Right. One of Franklin's points, you mentioned the ripening. 
he felt, I mean, all astrologers, I think, feel the birth chart is the primary chart. And any kind of prediction is just the unfolding of the birth chart, that certain patterns in the birth chart ripen at certain times of life. And so he's using his symbolic measures to find out when something will ripen, be ready to bear fruit in the life of the native. But it's always present there initially at birth. Hmm. And so it seems like his and, argument was if when he was using directions of progressions, etc., if as he said in that previous ones, it was hit or miss. So the, th the times that it didn't hit, maybe that wasn't a time for the native where there was a ripened area for picking, I guess, for a lack of a better word. Right. And, and this theme goes through the literature. I think Marinus discusses it. He said, Marinus will say in his book on um, solar returns, often you will see a primary direction, which was the, the main tool in the 17th century and prior uh, in a certain year, but nothing happens. And Marina says, well, nothing happens because you need the solar return that corresponds or is an analogous to that direction mm. for what's potential to manifest in reality, that it's the real time configuration that take, takes this takes the primary direction matches it and then indicates the timing yeah. and the other thing franklin he liked the symbolic measures because he said with those you are always looking at the birth chart and how it's unfolding with other measures like directions progressions Many astrologers will cast a progressed chart for the year, and then you you lose what's coming from the birth chart. You're looking for, at a separate chart, and it's hard to keep track of where did this come from at birth. So it and sounds like the point. argument is, and and which seems to be correct, is the source is always the natal chart. You always look back. Always, so yeah. always look back to the natal chart. Right. That at the. Th the theory is anything that happens is an unfolding of the natal chart. The only thing you don't know is what time it will happen. You know what will happen, but not when it will happen. And these other measures tell you when. Okay. His new measures. So this is a brief summary. I mean, his, his books, they're brief and they seem to be quite simply written but when you get into them, they are so profound. <laughs> it's just remarkable, I think. <clears throat> um, as a result of his research on hundreds of charts, he proposed several new or neglected measures. As he, he researched the literature and found there were ideas that astrologers weren't using, but he thought did work. So birth numbers, this is the one I was most skeptical of. This is you add the, the digits of your birth date and that identifies a year that may be important. It's I was funny, skeptical. I was fairly skeptical too. And I was reading the books. I've never, you know, delved into numerology. And of course, I've right. been off the mind. So uh, obviously, I, I calculated my numbers and it, it was correct. It was a 33 for me and other numbers as well. But 33 in particular was a very significant mm -hmm. year. So I, I was like, ah, this is really, yeah. really interesting. It, it is surprising. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm still somewhat skeptical, but they seem to work. Um, it's it's a, this idea that certain whole numbers have significance goes way back to Pythagoras, and I was actually just I just saw a video on what piqued my curiosity was magical numbers in modern chemistry, <laughs> and it turns out there there are certain numbers that have to do with the number of protons and neutrons in the uh, nucleus of an atom. And it, this was discovered and then doubted for many years because it implied that like electrons have electron shells that only hold a certain number of electrons, that the, the properties of an atom seem to be, be determined by these quote magical numbers 
And so in the nucleus, I think they're like two, you can have two protons and the next step up is eight protons. And then the next step up is 20 and then 28 and, then, and so on. Hmm. And that these are key numbers that really, and the people who discovered this were eventually won a Nobel prize that oh, wow. determine the properties of atoms. And they're these whole numbers. <laughs> Incredible. It just Incredible. It turned out to be very important. So it, it's interesting. Ptolemy it's beyond my eight. scope of understanding, but it sounds fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ptolemy's Seven Ages of Man. This is very old. It goes back to Ptolemy, obviously. And the idea is that each planet governs a certain period of life in a certain sequence. And so if you know how old somebody is, you know which is a dominant planet for that period, a time lord, basically. And Franklin says, we should pay attention to these time lords. They're not just something Ptolemy invented. They they work. <laughs> so it's becoming so, more it's becoming more popular beginning to use the Seven Ages Man of, again in this day and age. But at that time, were astrologers not using the Seven Ages of Man? I don't think so. I, I don't know for sure, but I don't think so. Hmm. You know, Shakespeare writes about them too, <laughs> the Seven Ages of Man. So it's it's, a, but I, I don't think astrologers are using them much. Interesting. Uh, the point of life. Now, this he got from Alan Leo, who in the late 1800s was writing about it. And Alan Leo was reflecting on the orbit of the planet Uranus being 84 years. And what struck him is that that's very close to the average human lifespan. And so what if symbolically, 84, we equate 84 years with the human lifespan, which would mean that each sign of the zodiac covers seven years of life. And I think based on the ideas coming from Germany, you'd start the measurement at the vernal point zero Aries. And this would mean that your first seven years would be governed by Aries in your chart. Whatever Aries covers in your chart, whatever houses it covers and planets are there, uh, would reflect what's going on in your first seven years of life. Mm -hmm. And then Taurus would be your next seven years of life to age 14. You know, and it's a Gemini is next, uh, 14 to 21. And all the way around the wheel. And this, it works. I mean, if, if you, this is one of Franklin's major techniques. Carter wrote about it. It's, it's quite striking. And this was new to me. I didn't know about this before I read Carter's book, uh, Franklin's books. But if you start looking at charts this way, um, like you're, you're in your mid thirties now, you know? I'm uh, 37. 37. So I think I think Virgo starts at 35 to 42. Yeah, because Libra would be 42. It's halfway around. So you're in a Virgo period in this system. So wherever Virgo is in your chart, whatever planets it contains, whatever houses it's covering, should be major themes at this point in your life. I mean, that's how he would do it. Fascinating. But you say it goes from zero Aries and then it's seven... In other words... Your first seven years of life are the sign Aries. Okay. Your second seven years, Taurus. Your third seven oh, years. Oh, sorry, I was going by Gemini. degree. Okay, so seven. Not seven, degree, no, it's sign. Through. Ah, in, okay. It's seven year periods. So Cancer's 21 to 28. Uh, after Cancer comes Leo, right? <laughs> 28 to 35. And then after Leo's Virgo, 35 to 42. Fascinating. So you're in your Virgo period and if you look at your chart and study just that section that's covered by Virgo and reflect on it, it should be indicating major themes coming up in your life now, according to this theory. That, that really is quite interesting. And actually thinking about that just on the top of my head, it's my it's my 12th house. I'm, I'm Libra rising and I've, I've had a few close people, family members die in mm -hmm. the last couple of years as well. So I've had that that 12th letting go um, mm -hmm. theme as well, 12th house issue. So that's really quite interesting. It is. Okay. Age along the zodiac. 
this is probably the simplest measure you had. You just take your age, convert it to degrees, and measure again from zero areas. Um, so if you're 17 years old, then you look at 17 degrees of Aries in your chart. <laughs> you know, if you're 30 years old, you're moving into Taurus. If you're 60 years old, you're moving into Gemini and so on. And then he, again, using this sort of symbolic ideas, he said, in astrology and in general, in the occult sciences or arts, the numbers four and seven keep coming up. There's four quadrants, uh, four seasons, et cetera. And seven, seven planets. Four times seven is 28, the number of days in the lunar cycle, and so on. So these numbers seem to be highly significant. And therefore, he says, what if we looked at four-sevenths of the age uh, instead of the pure age, which he also looks at? Let's look at this fraction of the age and see, for instance, if you're, say, 14 years old, four-sevenths of that is eight. So you look at age 14, you look at 14 Aries and then also at eight Aries and see what they're doing in your chart. That is what planets they may be aspecting, house cusps they may be aspecting, etc. cetera. Um, and what midpoints, he started using midpoints. Now he didn't have the same sophistication we have today about midpoints, but he, for any of these significant points he's generating, he's asking what midpoints do they fall on in the chart? And that's quite fascinating. And I'll, I think we'll get to an example that shows it. And then he had this idea, since the cusps of the houses are supposedly the most powerful points of signification of the house, what if we just add together two cusps and then combine the meanings of the two houses? And he found that the, he tried adding various cusps. He found that one of the most powerful additions was to start with the fourth house cusp, which is the foundation of the chart, and then add any other cusp to it. Um, and, and then that would give a sensitive point that you could again study to see. If you want to study illness, you might add the fourth plus the sixth. Or if you want to study illness that was potentially lethal, you would add the sixth plus the eighth cusps and that would be a point of lethal illness. And then use it basically like an Arabic part. Mm. Um, and then he, he and Carter also began using his symbolic measures to direct the entire chart. So you could take, say at age 17, we used that before. If you want to know what's going on, you would add 17, move the whole chart forward by 17 degrees and see what connections it was making with the birth chart. Uh, okay, so these are his basic measures. So I have some examples, uh, which I, I sort of picked at random. I was recently thinking about Robert Zoller's chart, so I added this in here. And uh, well, let's start with this one. So I, I think everyone knows who Robert was. He He's deceased now, he died a few years ago, actually at the beginning of COVID. Um, a leading medieval astrologer. I had met him and knew him. Uh, and he was quite a good astrologer, very dedicated to these traditional techniques. Uh, he passed away on the eve of his 73rd birthday. That is, the next day would have been his solar return. So he died literally at age 72 which he had predicted back around 1980, which is interesting. He, he thought his length of life was about 72 years. Uh, it's interesting you got some of these astrologers predicting their own passing away. I think Carter before, yeah. I think, and, and with Zola here as well. Really, really quite interesting. Yeah. So I thought it'd be interesting to look at this from the point of view of uh, Franklin's techniques. Mm. 
So in Alan Leo's scheme at age 73, because he's about to turn 73, <clears throat> uh, that would that would be an Aquarius. Aquarius goes from 70 to 77, and then Pisces 77 to 84, something like that. Uh, 12 Aquarius 51 becomes a significant point in the chart at age 73. Uh, so 20 years earlier, uh, it was announced that he was diagnosed with Parkinson's. Um, in Franklin's measures, age 73, you age along the zodiac, 73 degrees from zero Aries takes you to 13 of Gemini. Aries is 30, Taurus is, gets you to 60, and then you have 13 degrees left over in Gemini. Um, and then if we do four sevenths of the 73, we have 41.71, which is 11, Taurus 43. So Franklin would look at these points in the chart and wonder what's going on at this age, 73. So roughly 13 Aquarius, maybe 12 Taurus and um, let's see, okay, 13 Gemini. So let's look at Zola's chart. Well, Franklin always began just looking at the chart and wondering about it before he did anything else. And he would have looked at this chart and I'm assuming would have been struck by this opposition. We have mm. three planets in Aquarius on the 11th cusp opposing two planets in Leo, very close to the sixth cusp. And so Franklin would immediately think, oh, this means at some point in his life, a risk of some kind of serious illness. Mm. Uh, he didn't know about Chiron, but today we would say, with this, it's a T-square with Chiron, which is in the eighth house. Mm. Uh, okay. And Franklin would then wonder, when might this manifest in the life of this person? So he would look at Leo, Aquarius, and the midpoints, which would be Taurus and, um, and Scorpio. All right, so let's look at some of these dates. He's 53 and diagnosed with Parkinson's. At 53, we get to age corresponds to 23 of Taurus because you start at zero Aries, 30 degrees to the end of Aries leaves you with 23 degrees in Taurus to get to 53. 23 of Taurus is right here opposite the Jupiter in the eighth. And it's very widely square, this opposition, but it's, it's really opposite the Jupiter in the eighth. And so there's an emphasis now on Scorpio, eighth house, and also Venus and Taurus. Venus, yeah. And he would also then look at four sevenths of this measure, four sevenths of 53 takes us to 30.28, which is really the first degree of Taurus mm. right here. And that happens to be on the second cusp and opposing the eighth cusp and using Placidus. He used Placidus cusp. Oh, no, this is Reggio Montanus. I'm sorry. Mm. Uh, I put it in Reggio Montanus because I was thinking of a traditional chart. But actually, I think Zoller finally went to Alcabicius, not Reggio Montanus, mm. in his work. But anyway, in any case, in the Reggio Montanus system, the four sevenths measure lights up the, the second and eighth cusp axis, which again emphasizes the eighth house. And so there's something potentially life threatening going on at this age. He's and diagnosed there as with well, serious... squaring that Mars at zero degrees Aquarius, so right. T square with the Saturn as well. Interesting. Exactly. Squaring almost exactly the Mars which is on the cusp of the 12th house and opposite the sixth cusp. So he would look at really, all... really fascinating. And when I was reading your book, I was um, going back at certain dates and ages. So if anyone watching this wants to apply some of these techniques, you know, either 
get Anthony's book and apply some of these things. Really, really is fascinating. So much information that would have been lost to me because it's it's so fascinating. Yo, let's continue here. So the most difficult configuration in the chart, he often looked for the most difficult configuration because he figured if people are coming to see an astrologer, it's mm. probably because the difficult parts of their chart are acting up. <laughs> so he wants to know what, what might be acting up. And so Franklin would say that the most difficult configuration is this Mars, Sun, Mercury opposing Pluto. He didn't know about Pluto actually at the time, but we do. And Saturn. So we've got the two malefics opposing each other right on the Sun and Mercury uh, and in on the 12th cusps. This is a difficult configuration. I hope, hope you don't mind, mind me adding as well. Just thinking oh, please about, do. Yeah. about the age of 53 uh, when he was I think diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, I believe that's right. I just I just found it interesting because at the age of 53, you've got the sixth house perfected year. So that's going to activate that not in great condition Saturn. You've got the Pluto, which you wouldn't have known mm -hmm. about. But that Lord of the Year would have been that sun in detriment, conjunct that outer set malefic, and just bringing in, as you've said before, this this six twelfth axis, and we've got mm -hmm. health concerns here. And mm -hmm. I just thought that was an interesting layer in terms of perfected, perfected house and all of these activated areas that are going on with this chart. It seems like all of them are conflating together to indicate quite serious health issues at 53. Right, and, and his point is his symbolic measures are an addition to what you already study and know. And they, if you use them, things you wouldn't have thought might occur, it becomes more apparent why they might occur at that age. So in and of themselves, they're not enough. He says, you need the real-time measures as well. But if you combine the two, you have a very powerful tool. Incredible. Um, so where, where was I? So these are in early Aquarius. They're opposing these here in early in Leo. And by Leo's measure, Aquarius is ages 70 to 77, but these planets all fall, if we include the, Le the opposition of Leo here, in the first three years of this period, in other words, ages 70 to 73. Am I clear here? It was the seven years from ages 70 to 77 belong to Aquarius, says Adam Leo. Okay. But the emphasized part of the Aquarius in, by either direct presence or by opposition are basically the first 12 degrees, which correspond to ages 70, 71, 72, up to 73. So he would say, based on this, a early 70s is likely to be a very difficult period for this native. And there are likely to be serious health issues because we've got Saturn opposing Mars on the um, 612 axis. So possible of hospitalization, serious illness, things like that, confinement. And he would look at the chart and say immediately, oh, your early 70s are, you know, it looks like serious health issues going on. Mm -hmm. We just, it would take him a few seconds to see that, mm, <laughs> which to me is amazing that he could do that. Um, I mean, he's also taking into account that Mars here is ruling the eighth and the first. So Mars is ruling the house of death and the house of the uh, body, of the health. The sun is ruling the sixth and is opposed by Saturn in the sixth. So health again. Yeah, it Saturn doesn't, seem, it doesn't seem like that mutual reception is, is mitigating too much. It seems like there's, there's too much going on. <laughs> right. Yeah. And well, I won't, there's a whole discussion about mutual deception, receptions. Marinus, for instance, would say the worst position of Saturn is in Leo. And if you have a mutual reception like this, Saturn in Leo is quite damaging. And the sun in Aquarius 
is in its detriment. So you have two planets in really bad shape in opposition, which is a difficult aspect. Hmm. How can you logically say that the usual reception is going to pull them out of this? It makes no sense. Sure. <laughs> That's not the best. <laughs> All right. Um, Mercury's involved in this. Mercury rules the seventh and the fourth. Fourth is endings. And the seventh, especially the cusp of the seventh, is considered difficult because it opposes the ascendant. And the seventh is the house of open enemies. Um, so these, okay, by the four sevenths measure. So let's take four sevenths of 73. And we, we calculated that to be 11 of Taurus 43. So that's over here um, at age 73. And what is it doing? Well, the 11 of Taurus 43 is very closely square Pluto in, this, in the um, sixth. So again, there's this theme as it advances because as he's getting older, this will will get the 12 Taurus and will be in partile square to Pluto. So at age 73, again, he, he died just before he turned 73 one day. At age 73, we're going to have this exact four sevenths measure square to Pluto. And he gave an orb of like about a degree to these things, thinking that it He's identifying a year, not a specific date, so that he would look at where where will this 11 Taurus 43 be a year from now? That's an orb. It certainly is going to square the Pluto within that year. Ah. So th that marks age 73 as a very difficult year for illness. Okay. Um, what do I have here? This... Age along the zodiac is with 13 Gemini. So where's that in the chart? 13 Gemini is here in the third house. It has recently passed the lunar node axis. And it's, oh, and it's squared. It has squared the uh, mm. moon ascendant. But that occurred really about a year before this. So at least more like, it indicates age 72, but more like the beginning, a year before he died. Oh. It got emphasized. Mm. But again, he's looking at these one-year periods because he's not trying to be precise. Interesting. And so he would say ages, at least 72 and 73 are probably the most difficult in this period. All right. These are primary directions, which are a real-time measure because they're based on the motion of the sky after birth. <clears throat> um, Franklin did use primary directions. He just found that, like Marinus, they weren't always pinpoint accurate. Sometimes things occurred a year or two earlier or later. Uh, I calculated these using the Placidus system, not the Regimontana system, with zero latitude. And the measure I find works best when I use them uh, is not the Ptolemy key or the Nibod key, but I use the midpoint of the two. And that usually comes pretty close to an event. Interesting. Uh, and so if you look at age 72, you know, he passed away in January of 2020, right here. The active primary directions were a square of the sun coming to Mars, a square of Pluto coming to the sun, and the square of Saturn coming to Mars. So those are those are quite yeah. a few hits, and, and they're the they're hits in this same region that he was drawn to when he first saw the chart, emphasizing the twelfth and the sixth houses again. Huh. So really quite astounding. So he would have seen this, and Franklin would have seen this as a real time measure culminating you know, around the beginning of 2020, the end of 2019, and combined it with his symbolic measures and, and said, you know, risk of a very serious, potentially fatal illness around age 72, 73. Wow. Okay, so that's this. Um, 
Okay. Any questions or comments? No, it's just remarkable, like layering all of this together and and seeing what's going on and, and just the, the accuracy is is quite mind blowing, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. So let's birth numbers. So let's birth numbers again. I said my I'm most skeptical of, but they seem to work. <laughs> so basically the idea is you take your birth date and you add the digits together. And he said, there's two ways to do this in Franklin's system. Your birth date might consist of only single digits, like someone born on September 3rd, that's nine and three single digits. He's talking about the month and the day. Whereas somebody uh, born November 13th, like King Charles, would have double digits. The November's a double digit and the 14 is a double digit. If any one of the, the month or the day is a double digit, he consider a double digit birth number. Hmm. So you add those together as double digits, and then you add the digits in the year to it. So those are his two types of birth numbers. So he, he loves this example, Alan Leo, uh, who I think he knew personally, but I think he had hmm. met and knew personally when he moved to London. Leo died in the, the, around the time of world, the middle of the teens. Born August 7th, 1860. So August is eight, seven. These are single digit numbers. So you add seven plus eight and get 15. And you add the 15 to one, eight, six, and zero. Uh, so it's 16 plus, plus eight and six is uh, 14, you get 30. So Alan Leo single digit birth number is 30. And Franklin says this probably but not necessarily indicates a highly significant year in his life but only if there's some kind of real-time significant astrological configuration going on at the same time and then he said you can further reduce this 30 to 3 because 3 plus 0 is 3 and 3 may be an important number in his life as well um it turns out that Alan Leo first published his extremely influential journal, Modern Astrology, at the age of 30. <laughs> um, okay. This is why reading the book at first, I was I was like, I'm not never delved into numerology. Right. Like I said before, I'm, I'm um, you know, I was, I was fairly skeptical. But when I did it, and if anyone watching this, if you just go through what Anthony's talking about here and do let us know in the comments below if you've count when you calculate yours if there are significant numbers that come up for you and uh, really is fascinating and when i for me 33 highly significant year and of course anthony you've said other factors have to be included as well but i was like huh this is really quite fascinating because it seems to really work <laughs> yeah well then this is even more and she then says you can take your initial fundamental birth number like 30 for alan leo and then you can get what he calls the additional birth number, which is you take your basic birth number and add it to your birth year. So you would take 30 for Alan Leo, which is his basic birth number. And he was born in 1860. So we add 30 plus 1860 and get 1890. And then we reduce that. So one plus eight plus nine plus zero is what? One and eight is nine, nine, nine is 18. So it gives us 18. And then you keep reducing it till you get a single digit. So one plus eight is nine. So we have this sequence, 30 plus 1860 is 1890. That reduces to 18, that reduces to nine. And so then you add your basic birth number to these other numbers that are generated. 30 is basic number plus 18 plus nine, the two numbers generated by adding his year of birth. And that takes us to 57. And guess what? He died at age 57. <laughs> it's just, uh, it just is. It's so incredible yeah. when I was reading your book as well, and you've got plenty of other examples. So I, I definitely implore people to to purchase the book and, and just check out these fascinating yeah. um, case cases. Right. And so 57... And he's born in 1860, so he died in 1917, correct? And I think Franklin had moved to London a few years before 1917. 
and got involved in the astrological community and I'm sure met and knew Alan Leo. Uh, here's Alan Leo's chart. He died August of 1917 at age 57. His age along the zodiac, remember, convert 57 years to 57 degrees, measure from zero Aries, and that takes us to 27 of Taurus, which is here, happens to be exactly square. <laughs> His Saturn <laughs> in the first house, it's just, it's, it's remarkable. Um, Incredible. Or we we take four sevenths of his age along the zodiac, and that turns out to be two point five, two and a half degrees of Taurus, and that is very closely square his lunar nodes, not exactly, and it's on the Sun Mars midpoint, which happens to be at two of Scorpio thirty one. Uh, sun rules his ascendant uh mars rules what the ninth and we're in the fourth so fourth is endings conditions at the end of life so the midpoint of the ascendant ruler and the fourth ruler get stimulated uh, at the same age that he dies and his point of life this is the alan leo measure hmm. um <clears throat> he's 57 57 falls in the Sagittarius period from 56 to 63. So each degree, seven into 30 is a little over four. So it's roughly about four or five degrees of Sagittarius. And what is that doing in the chart? Oh, right here, I put it. Yeah, five Sagittarius. That's here and it semi-squares the Mars. Remarkable. Throw it all of these together. Yeah. Mm. Oh, and by transit, he's because he's looking at real time. Ah. Saturn in transit, the day of his demise, conjoins the eighth ruler Jupiter on the 30th of August. The, the transits are exact on the 30th of August. Oh, he died on the 30th of August. I don't know if I made a mistake here. I thought there was a difference of when this, this became exact. Well, add, adding on like I, I did before, I mean, it's interesting. You've got a, a tenth house perfected here now, Fallon Leo, and the year is death. So that 27 Taurus, you've got the activated um, part of the chart as well. So that Pluto's activated during that year. You've got Lord of the Year, Venus, and that fairly mm -hmm. troublesome T square with the, the Mars and the Moon here as mm -hmm. well. And then all these other factors you're, you're laying out here, laying the groundwork is, is, is quite incredible. Right. And again, he's not discarding the traditional techniques. Sure. He's saying this is an additional factor that helps you determine when things are going to happen or whether things are going to happen. He must have been a very busy fellow. <laughs> putting everything. He, he apparently had a remarkable reputation in the introduction to, I think it's his first book, one of his clients became a student of his and then helped him in his research. Ah. Uh, his name is Prothero Smith, I think. And he writes this introduction. This is fascinating. He says, basically, uh, I, I was in my mid-20s when I went to see Mr. Franklin. I'd been studying astrology for a few years and all these things that were happening in my life, and I couldn't see anything in my chart to account for them. And I was about to give up astrology and think it was a, a bunch of crap. <laughs> but I figured I'll give it one more chance. I heard this Franklin guy was pretty good. I went to see him. And uh, I brought a copy of my chart with me. And he, he sat me down. He said, let me look at your chart. He studied it for a few minutes. And he said, oh, I see you're going through. And he listed all the things I'd been going through the past few years that I couldn't see in my chart in a matter of minutes. Wow. <laughs> and I, so I said to him, can I study with you? <laughs> because I want to learn how you did that. I would say and, the same thing. I'm like, can I, can I hang out with you? <laughs> and Franklin said, well, yeah, I, I'm doing this research. I'm writing this book. And I, mm. I could use some help start re researching these charts. I don't have time to do all this and keep my practice going. Yeah. And so they began to collaborate. 
what, what I find remarkable about William Franklin and obviously everything that you put in the book, it's not, it's not theoretical either. I mean, it's, it's this thriving practice. It's basing this off, you know, actual research from, from actual clients. And I think it just gives credence to all mm -hmm. of the symbolic measures, all the techniques he's talking about. And I find that's it's rather fascinating. Yeah, I mean, his goal was to have an efficient way of reading a chart and seeing a lot of clients. Hmm. Okay. King Charles, okay. About the time I was preparing these slides, King Charles got diagnosed with cancer. So I thought it'd be interesting to look at his chart. And um, you probably know, I'm sure you know a lot more about the the royal family than I do since I'm not British. But I thought I would just follow Franklin's techniques and see where they led. Um, they've had their they've had their ups and downs, I'd say that much. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so King Charles was born November 14th, 1948. The good thing about the royal family is you tend to know pretty accurately the birth time. Absolutely. Mm. Uh so he's a double digit person, 11th month, 14th day. So we're going to add 11 and 14 to 1, 9, 4, and 8. And that gives us 47. So by Franklin's theory, 40, age 47 ought to be a really significant year in this, in Charles's life. If there's other kind of real time configurations going on that corroborate that. And I, I really don't know the royal family that well, I mean, not their history, that is. Um, but the question is, was age 47 a highly memorable year? And so I looked up King Charles or Prince Charles and age 47. And guess what? This was the headline. <laughs> On this day in history, Prince Charles and Diana officially uh, divorced. Pretty big They've been deal. separated for a while, but yep. this was apparently a big deal in the royal family, having an official divorce, a legal divorce, and, and it kind I mean, of even ended. Even in nineteen ninety six, it's still you know with the the history and the traditions of divorce and just the um, yeah. you know, the the view of the royal family at that point, they were very much against. I know the queen was very much against a divorce, but unfortunately, you know, it just mm -hmm. had to happen in the end. I think. Right. And the whole saga of Charles and Diana had been in the news endlessly before that. So, so I think this qualifies as a highly memorable and significant year in the life of Charles. Uh, so and this is just based on the birth number. So are there other things going on at age 47? Uh, this is his chart. I, I did this in uh, Astro. See Astro Seek, I think. These are Placidus houses. And I was just in marriage. So I, Saturn is the traditional ruler of the seventh cost Aquarius. Uh, at age 47, his perfection, if we look at perfections, it's a 12th house perfection year. So a cancer, 12th sign perfection year. And um, Moon. So the moon is the lord of the year, or the lady of the year, I guess. Mm. And um, that was an early degree. Why did I say 10th? I think I meant 12th ruler here. Did I say 10th? I think this is an error. Oh, that's fine. But we can see, of course, it's the yeah. 12th house ruler. Okay. Yeah. It's a typo. Uh, oh, I, oh, I was thinking that the moon is in the 10th. That's what I was thinking. So it's the oh, moon's yeah, placement yeah. is in the tenth. Yeah, just so this is in a there mistake. Into, into Taurus. I yeah, meant to say yeah. tenth house significance. Oh, that's fine. Tenth, tenth house position. Mm -hmm. So the tenth house and the twelfth house become prominent. The tenth, of course, is public standing, reputation. It could include divorce because it's a major change in your status publicly, and the twelfth is a house of endings, undoing, and things like that. So it kind of makes sense. It's quite interesting. I think the queen, his mother, was behind the scenes pulling a few strings as well. So that's quite an interesting. Most thing. likely, yeah. yeah. And then in Ptolemy's system, we hadn't talked about Ptolemy previously. This is a Mars period. He gives 
the moon to infancy, followed by Mercury, where you're kind of studying as a child, then Venus, you're an adolescent and you're horny, and, and that's followed by the sun. This is young adulthood, like 20s, 30s, and then you get to your Mars period, followed by Jupiter, finally followed by Saturn. So at age 47, he should be a mature adult, and he's in a Mars period. So you have to wonder, what is Mars doing in his chart? Mars, of course, rules the 10th. And where is Mars? It's over here. It's in the 5th. It's interesting. <laughs> it's his love affairs, right? Um, but Mars, in general, is some kind of conflict. Mm. And... Uh, so you would expect him to be in some sort of a struggle or conflict, competition. Mm. And you could consider divorce in a general way to fit there. Okay. Just, just on a wider point of view, so what uh, the Mars period is 47. What age does it begin? I don't know off the top of my head, the Mars period. Um, I think 42. 42. I, I, just, I was just thinking as we were looking at that, I wonder if there's statistics or anything that, shows that most divorces happen maybe between say 42 47 I'd, with mars i'm just thinking of separation and conflict and i, I wonder if mm -hmm. there is a correlation between that life period and and divorce of course there's many other factors to, to yeah. talk about but anyway it was just something that just popped into my head yeah no that's an interesting question i don't have an answer yeah this is his solar return at age 47 you remember we've identified 47 as a symbolically important year uh, and a, a major real-time measure would be the solar return. So what's going on in his solar return? Uh, the moon is the lady of the year this year, we said. Uh, the solar return ascendant is ruled by Mars, and he's in a Mars period, so there is that Mars emphasis. Mm. The solar return 7th and 12th are ruled by Venus. The natal 7th ruler, this is because when Aquarius is on the seventh in the natal chart, is Saturn. And Saturn is in the solar return, fourth of endings. Mm. Uh, and it happens to be square Venus, ah. which rules the seventh and twelfth. So that and and it happens to be conjunct Mars, which is Ptolemy's Lord of the Period, uh, plus the ascendant ruler of the solar return. So we can see at least stress in the marriage here. Um, That's really quite interesting, Paul. And as, as you said, you've got Mars connections with the malefics. So you've got that applying conjunction to Mars, so maybe separation. That, as you pointed out there, the applying square to Saturn, that Venus rule in the seventh, and you're layering all this together. Um, yeah, very much. It seems like a very difficult, conflicted year with relationships. Right, and then. In solar returns, I use the true lunar nodes, and I find repeatedly when the true nodes are stationary in a solar return, that's a highly significant year. Ah. And often there's some kind of disruptive event in the life of the native. And it turns out that this Neptune-Uranus conjunction is at the bendings of the nodes. Ah, yeah. Mm. And Uranus is a modern signifier of divorce. Um, and the nodes are on the 12th, 6th axis. So this is clearly a stressful year. And, um, it's really interesting. I, I, I think, think Natalie, this... doesn't he have the, the Venus-Neptune conjunction? Natalie, was that before? But um, uh, let me look. No, He has a, a Neptune-Venus conjunction. Sorry, Neptune. Yeah, Neptune-Venus. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So that's a age forty. Well, he, he might have made you know not a fun year, but he might have gained a sense of freedom and uh, freedom eventually mm -hmm. <laughs> for him. Yeah. yeah. Okay. His solar arc directions. So the, now the solar arc directions are close to the the uh, age along the zodiac. The age along the zodiac just takes your age and converts it to degrees. Solar arc measures the you know, how far the sun has traveled since birth. It adds that to everything. And so usually the age along the zodiac and the solar arc are within a 
a few degrees of each other. So at age 47, his solar arc sun uh, is at 10 of Capricorn. And the midpoint of, oh, this was, as we're looking at midpoints, the midpoint of the solar arc directed sun at age 47, the year of the divorce, uh, with his natal moon at 0, 26 Taurus, conjoins the natal Saturn. I think I have a picture of this. Hmm. The sun moon midpoint is taken to, to be a symbol of marriage, the union of husband and wife. And Saturn is a, a symbol of separation, hardship, and uh, difficulty. And so we have this real-time measure supporting the symbolic measures. So here's what I'm talking about. This is his birth chart. So, so now I think this is a 90 degree dial. Yeah. Here's his birth Saturn. And it's right at age 47 at the midpoint of natal sun and solar arc directed moon. Mm. Or if you look at it this way, natal moon and solar arc directed sun exactly on the um the mid, those midpoints exactly correspond to natal Saturn. Wow. So I thought that was interesting. Absolutely. Okay. So here is a kind of real-time measure, solar arc measure that indicates severe difficulty Saturn in the marriage at age 47. And I think the Iranians regard Saturn as a planet of separation. Hmm. You okay. mentioned here as well what the solar arc Pluto was that onto the oh. ascendant. I was just reading the uh, solar oh, arc directed the... Pluto to natal ascendant midpoint is also on natal Saturn. Huh? Mm -hmm. Oh right, yeah, right here. Here's um the natal ascendant and the directed solar arc directed Pluto uh -huh. is exactly on the Saturn natally. Wow, incredible. Okay. These are Ptolemy's ages you had asked about. Yeah, Mars. Oh, yeah, yeah, Mars. Uh, so starting at 41, interesting, okay. Duration for 15 years. I do that, yeah. Right, uh, Jupiter starts at 56. Saturn, depending who you read, is either old 68 to death or 68 yeah. plus 30 years, and then you start your infancy again, <laughs> where you're 100 and something. <laughs> But from, from 41 to, what would that be, to 56? It does make me wonder if... It's uh, a 15-year period. Yeah. 50, yeah, it makes me wonder if the ponderance of divorce is happening in those periods. Um, anyway, I'll have to look mm -hmm. that up myself. I'm just talking yeah. to myself right now. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's interesting stuff. Mm. But these are useful and, frankly, uses them as a background. So, say you have a 15-year-old and they're not at all interested in, then mm. you think there's a problem here, <laughs> right? Or you have a child who's six years old who's not interested in learning or school. That, that's a mm. problem. He should be doing Mercury things. Yeah, yeah. But it is or a really have... good point, and it, it ties in everything that you've been talking about by the context of the client who comes to you, the context of what age they're at, what, what is their you know, period, the seven ages of man, and... and taking a wider view before you start getting into the weeds of the chart, just bringing up again, the context, where are they at in life and what are they doing at this moment in time? Right. And does it match the, the, the ruler? For instance, the son, say you have a 23 year old. Well, this is young adulthood. They should be doing solar things like establishing their own identity in the world. Right. But this 23 year old is, is at home in the base of playing video games and not and dependent on his parents, well, mm. then there's a problem. <laughs> uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, maybe if he were 19, he'd be more of the newsy, and that might be okay. But when you get into a sun period, you should be doing sun things. Okay. All right. So the point of life. So this is the 84-year cycle of Alan Leo. <clears throat> You begin at zero Aries, we talk, and these are the um, ages just written out in this form. 
and he's 47, so he's in his Libra period, toward the end of his Libra period. He's actually five-sevenths of the way through. There's seven years, he's the fifth year, and five-sevenths of 30 degrees. He's he's in this period that starts at about 21 and a half degrees of Libra, because each year is a little more than four degrees. So we ask in his chart, what's going on in like the early 20s of Libra? Well, let's see. The early 20s of Libra is right here. It's in his fourth house. And um, it goes for about four degrees. So we're talking about 21 to 26, that range here. Is it going to aspect anything or what's... It's dispositor is Venus, it's in Libra. What is Venus doing? Uh, let's see. Yeah, natally he had the Venus conjunct Neptune. Okay. Uh, hmm. and, uh, and it's this is at the beginning of his fourth house, or this is the fourth cusp. And so the fourth house has a lot to do with endings as well as your domestic life. So there's some emphasis on his domestic setting, as well as potential endings of something. Mm. And we've got Neptune and Venus involved, so that could be a, an idealized romantic relationship, or it could be the dissolution of a, a romantic tie. Quite an interesting point, because really it was, uh, you know, such a, especially the wedding, such a media sensation and, mm -hmm. um, you know, such a, a glamorous couple. Well, she, she was glamorous. He wasn't. But you know, mm -hmm. with, the, right. with the 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 traps of the royal family and all those kind of things. But really, underneath the hood of that relationship was, as you say, um, disillusion of of matters and really an unhappy um, ending. Really, right. And then in the solar return, we saw that the Venus did rule the seventh as well as the twelfth. So there was this yep. combined seventh, twelfth. Let's go back to the solar return. Mm. So where was it? Um, and where's 20, 21 of Libra? 21 to 26 of Libra is right. Oh, it hits the nodes. Okay, interesting. Interesting. And it squares this. Squares the, the Neptune. Yeah, I hadn't seen it. Ah. His life this year is going to go from 21 to 26. It's going to hit the nodal axis, mm. which is on the 612 axis, and square the uh, Uran Neptune ah. Uranus here. Okay. That's why I like doing astrology live because it's so fascinating to find things out yeah. looking through. <laughs> right. It's really, really interesting. We've got some interesting years ahead of him as well. Okay. But I think the square to Uranus really does fit with getting divorced. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So where are we? Did we? Uh, let's see. Yeah. At we, age 47. Yeah. We did. We just did. Okay. One degree for each year of age is the age along the zodiac. At age 47, he's at 17 of Taurus. We already said that was in the 10th house, disposed by Venus. Mm -hmm. In natal chart, 17 of Taurus squares Pluto, which is at 16 Leo in the first. An emotionally intense period, major transformation. These are modern conceptions of Pluto. And that's very and much true. A major transformation in his personal and public life. Very, very much true, yep. And it's quincunx to the Venus, which is 16 Libra, mm. in the natal fourth. So whatever this transformation is involves fourth house issues and Venus. Incredible. All right. Let's see. His age along the Zulia, who goes from 17 to 18 of Taurus. I think we just did. Oh, I was here. I was showing the midpoints. Ah. Uh, Franklin didn't do this kind of extensive midpoint look, but I find it interesting to look at the midpoints in the 90 degree sort to see what midpoints are activated. And so the, the age along the zodiac, 1718 Taurus, is activating all these midpoints. For example, Moon Saturn. Uh, so it's Dispositor is Venus, and so we have the, it's a Venusian point mm. combining with Moon Saturn, and that could certainly be disappointment or separation and love. 
you've got all these midpoints, but uh, okay. yeah. Okay. Four sevenths of his age. Okay, so we've done the age forty-seven. We're going to do four sevenths of forty-seven. Twenty-six point eighty-six or twenty-six fifty-one Aries, almost twenty-seven Aries. It's ruled by Mars. If you look at the midpoints at about twenty-seven Aries, uh, we're going to get Sun Uranus, and I. These are summaries of Everton's tension, upset, adjusting new circumstances. Uh, Mercury, Venus, thoughts of love, the intellect influenced by feelings, and Mars, Saturn, harmful or destructive energy disputes and separations. It's quite so interesting these... that you've got the two there. So, you know, obviously the, the divorce and the destructive energies and separations, but it's quite interesting here that the thoughts of love, because he's obviously thinking to himself, okay, this divorce is, is happening, it's public, it's, it's you know, ruining reputation, et cetera, et cetera. But a part of him, maybe that's keeping him going, is his love for Camilla at this right. time, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. And yeah, I think this is the midpoint, the Mercury Venus that's most stimulated, late ah. 26, early 27. Yeah, yeah. So, so even with all the chaos and everything going yeah. around him, it, I still get that sense that keeping him going is is the love, I think, of, of Parker Bold. Right. I remember Venus in the solar return this year is the seventh house ruler, mm. cusp ruler. So he's thinking about love and it's probably not Diana. Ah, exactly. Yeah. All right. So I think this is what we're just showing what we just said. So I'm not going to. Adding house cusps. So this, I find, sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. It's sort of interesting, but for the sake of completeness, I thought we should do it and see if it works or not in this chart. Absolutely. Um, so outcome of marriage, well, the fourth house is a house of what happens at the end of things, and marriage is the seventh, so we add the fourth and the seventh and ask, we'll let this be a symbolic point of the outcome of marriage or the ending of marriage because it's four and seven. His fourth cusp is 13 Libra, his seventh cusp five Aquarius. We add those two longitudes together and it takes us to 18 Leo 39. Oh. Okay. 18. Oh, this is his solar return. Okay. So right up there with the moon. It's up there with the moon mm -hmm. in the ninth the sensitive point in the solar return. Maybe we should look at it in his birth chart. Here's his birth chart. 18 Leo, 39. Ah. It's close to Pluto, but a couple degrees away. And is it hitting anything else? I don't think so. Uh, no, I've only really got a, a, a trine to Mars, more yeah. or less, but that's at 20, 18, 19. Um, nothing right. too hard hitting, I don't think. But it's it's in his first toward the end of the first ruled by the sun. Okay. Mm. Here's the sun. Natalie is oh, right on the fifth cusps. Okay. So where did I? So here it is in his solar return for this year mm. in the ninth. Um, so eighteen could, Leo, you've got connection. What have you got the the? Quincunx to the the Saturn Mars Jupiter and that would actually form more or less like a yod sort of thing going on. Yeah, mm. and it's square. Look at this. It's square, ascended Mercury Sun. Ah, yeah, yeah, incredible. And it's ruled by the Sun, and because uh, really, the turn here, eighteen degrees seems to be the most prominent degree again. Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, mm -hmm, right? But right there at the top, that that really is quite interesting. And it's trining those. Mm. Um, oh, sorry, it's trining. Yeah, I'm, I'm using, I'm using trying, the whole sign. It's Leo, it's Leo down to here, yeah. That's I'm trying to adjust my mind out of the uh, whole sign. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Um, it's, it's in the ninth, which could be legal matters near the moon, opposing the part of fortune. Oh, this right opposite the part of fortune. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It's squaring Mercury and the sun. 
Well, that, I guess, was a stressful thing, too, to get publicly divorced in the royal family. And it's quincunx, the Saturn, mm. in the fourth of endings, with Saturn ruling his natal seventh of marriage. Fascinating. And the fourth would be domestic life and endings. Yeah. So that's so the so the sensitive point, I guess it makes some sense. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It certainly does for the solar return. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Franklin Carter also progressed chart points. In other words, if you had the age along the zodiac was a certain number of degrees, you could take any point in the chart and advance it by that amount. So an example here, to, let's take his natal Uranus, which is a modern ruler of Aquarius and signifier of divorce for modern astrologers. For the traditional astrologers listening, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> um, his natal Uranus is the very end of Virgo. It's got only five minutes of arc before it leaves Virgo. And it's very close to the cusp of the 12th house. His age along the zodiac at 47 means we add 47 to the 29. And if I did this correctly, that's 1655 of Leo. Okay. Wow. Conjunct natal Leo mm. in the first. So here's his birth chart. Um, if we take Uranus as a modern astrologer now to rule his marriage, seventh house, and being close to the 12th cusp to be some kind of undoing or problem, mm. and being a general signifier of disruption and divorce, and advance it by 47 degrees, we get almost exactly to his natal Pluto. That's really interesting. That's interesting. At age 47. So Franklin seeing this would predict age 47, I see some problems in the marriage. <laughs> <laughs> so just more and more information to add on, on top of this. It's highly right. significant, yeah. Uh, and as you pointed out, it could be transformative independence. You say mm. Uranus, Pluto in the first connected to the seventh. So freedom from marriage gives him but a that sense of independence sense. that's transformative for his life. Absolutely. Okay. So we're almost done here. I know it's this has been going on for a long time. This is so fascinating. I, I don't mind going on. <laughs> so let's look at his additional birth number. Remember, with Alan Leo, his first birth number, he established himself as a leading astrologer with his publication of his journal. And then his additional birth number gave us the, the, the uh, basically the year of his death. Now, not to say that that's what it indicates. It depends on the chart and what else is going on. Mm. But according to his, his basic birth numbers, 47, which was the year of the divorce. That's how we got there. He's born in 1948. We add 47 and 48, we get 1995 and reduce that as 24. And then that reduces the six. So to get the additional number, we have to add the original 47 to the 24 to the six. And that gives us age 77. So according to this symbolic measure, age 77, give or take a year, because Franklin is looking at like one year orbs here. But age 77 ought to be a highly significant age for the king. Mm. Um, in what way, we'd have to look at what else is going on in the chart. Uh, he's now 75 years. He's born in November, so he turned 75 in November of 23 last year. And he'll turn 76 in November of this year, and then 77 in November of next year, of 2025. Um, his cancer was diagnosed on the 26th of January. So he's 75 years old in a few months. Uh, 
will his health be a major issue at age 77 by this symbolic measure? And I calculate the solar arc since it's close. And it turns out solar arc Saturn will come to natal sun at age 76 in December of this year. Mm. So let's look at that in the chart. Here's his birth chart. Uh, this is the symbolic direction of Saturn to the sun, but it also happens to be the solar arc direction of Saturn to the sun because they differ by about a year. Um, so which one is more accurate? I don't know. But uh, if we add 77, it, it takes 77 degrees, nine minutes of arc on the, on the um, ecliptic of zodiac arc for Saturn to get exactly to the sun. That's how we got the 77 years. And the solar arc, it got there, my, that was the previous page, in December of 24, okay, which is like a year earlier. Mm. So it looks like the period from December of this year through the end of next year to January of, we're in 24, 24 of 26, is a highly emphasized, difficult period because we've got Saturn sitting on the sun. Absolutely. And Saturn rules his seventh and eighth, and the sun rules his first. Mm. Um, the other thing, I, I looked at his Placidian primary directions, which basically rotates the chart clockwise, and it turns out that at the same time that Saturn gets to the sun by solar arc, the sun, by primary motion, moves here and gets exactly to the cusp of the second, which opposes the cusp of the eighth. Oh, wow. So in December of this year, mm. we have this solar arc sun highlighting these two eight axis at the same time solar arc Saturn gets to the sun. Wow, wow. So to me, that looks like a difficult period for his health. So maybe adding towards the, maybe some some sort of deterioration. We've got a lot of health indicators, it seems, at this point. Right, and, but the other thing is interesting. Saturn rules the house in need, home, endings, illness, conflict, crisis, mortality, seven, eight, But the sun, which is influenced here, is sitting right on the cusp of the fifth, which is his children. Mm. So this could also be some really difficult period in the lives of his children, or one of them. Well, of course, and, and William and I think Kate. William's now. wife, Kate, is really, yeah. at the same time, comes down with cancer. It's interesting. It really is. So, But it makes sense because the king's son is afflicted, so he's sick. But the sun yeah. is sitting on the cusp of his his older son would be William would be yeah. the fifth cusp. Yeah, and so William is also suffering here, probably from worry about his father, but also from worry about his wife. Wow, wow. Um, and so Franklin would see to the end of this year through all of next year as being a difficult period okay. for the royal family, especially around matters of health. And of course, it looks certain to be that way at this moment. Yeah. Wow. wow. Um, let's see. His cancer is diagnosed. He was 75.2 years old. The point of life was at 22 Aquarius. Okay. So that's it. His point of life, the uh, Alan Leo point of life, Actually, on January 26th, this is a point of life. What did we say it was? It was 2217. 2217. And here the plaster's cross is 228. So point of life is right on this axis. Oh, wow. And at 22 Aquarius, we've got the sun there at 2225 Scorpio. Right. And it's it was 2217, I think. Uh, yeah, 17. Yeah. yeah. So that's like the midpoint of 22.8 and 22.25. Wow. So again, the, he, he really emphasized midpoints a lot. Let's see, 8 and 25 is what? 33. 
half of 33 is, well, it's 17, isn't it? 16 and a half. So the point of life when he's diagnosed with cancer at 2217, oops, is on the eighth cusp, square the sun, mm. and the midpoint of the 228 and the 2225 is 2217. Mm, wow. Hey, that's remarkable. It really is. <laughs> that's, that's, I hadn't seen that before. Okay. That's mind blowing. Wow. Uh, his age along the zodiac would be 15 because he's 75, 12 of Gemini, semi square the moon, which rules his 12th house of hospitalization. So 15 of Gemini, where is that? Da, 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 Gemini. Let's open the 11th. Uh... Gemini right here. Um, semi square the moon because that's zero. Sorry, what so was 15. The again, 11 something. What was it? Uh, well, right, he's he's not so concerned with exact degrees, it's oh, 15, okay. 12. Oh, 15, 12. Okay, uh, but it's close enough. Zero yeah. to 15 is a very good semi square here. It's a, the difference is what 13 minutes of arc, and the moon rules the 12th of hospitalization. And then we do the age of four sevenths of the age takes us to twelve fifty eight of Taurus, which essentially thirteen of Taurus. Uh, quincunx to the IC and Neptune. So thirteen of Taurus essentially is quincunx to the fourth cusp, and uh, Neptune's at fourteen. Yeah. Mm. So it's quincunx to right here, Neptune fourth cusp, uh, and he gets diagnosed with cancer. Wow, wow. All right. And I think, I think King Charles will confront problems when his point of life in the eighth house opposes Saturn. Let's go back here. He's, he's diagnosed with cancer right here on the eighth cusp. And then the point of life is going to keep moving up through Aquarius into Pisces and will oppose Saturn. Right. Meanwhile, Saturn, by solar arc and symbolic direction, is going to conjoin the sun. So this is going to be a very difficult period Absolutely, by, by the symbolic measures. So when will this point of life oppose Saturn? And what did we figure out? Uh, 78 and two months. Is that right? of, it enters Pisces during the seven years from 77 to 84 and will exactly oppose the natal Saturn at 78.2 years. Of age. So again, we've seen 77 to be, by symbolic measure, very difficult. And then mm -hmm. 78.2. So it looks like the the period he's seventy five point two now roughly. So, so the next three years are likely to be quite difficult with health problems for him. Okay. So it doesn't seem, at least by these measures, that um, it may disappear or maybe come back. But it, it seems like this might be now where it just prolongs in the next couple of years for for King Charles and what's going on. Right. His his point of life entered the eighth house on January 26th, the day he's diagnosed with cancer. Mm. And it's going to be passing through this, you know, for you know several years. It's going to hit it's going to oppose Saturn at age 78. Wow. And then he's got a couple of years after that. Till it gets to the ninth house. Um see so, yeah, the not to go off topic, but um, if anyone's got dark humor like I do, I just think to myself, he's probably sitting there thinking, bloody hell, I've been waiting all these decades to become king, and now I might only have a handful of years <laughs> to to fulfill that that destiny after waiting so long for his for his mother when uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, Queen Elizabeth mm -hmm. eventually eventually passed. So yeah, thinking bloody hell. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the other thing that's going to happen is the the point of life. It'll conjoin the part of fortune, which is probably helpful. 
but then immediately after it squares the Chiron, Chiron. which I find often Chiron lights up when there's physical problems, injuries, illnesses. Interesting. And that's in the fifth, so it could again involve his children in some way. Okay. And, uh, oh, I think this is what I, we were just talking about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, position oh, is not I had, I also, eclipses are obviously real time events. In February of 2027, there'll be a lunar eclipse at two of Virgo. Uh, very close to. The natal Saturn was on the Saturn and opposing the point of life. Mm. So that looks like uh, again, uh, you've got an eclipse lighting up your second and eighth houses with Saturn there, the symbolic point of life there. Uh, so February of 2027, based on the eclipse, sort of is a focal period for the sort of difficulty. I don't know if that's too wide for the eclipse. What's Chiron at 28 Scorpio, two degrees Virgo? Was that for the eclipse? Um, so I'm just talking off the top of my mind here. Um, but yeah, that um, seems quite quite interesting period. Yeah, I was more impressed by it. it's 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 right on Saturn. Oh, of Saturn's yeah. at oh, five of Virgo Saturn as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, and uh, and Saturn rules six, seven, and eight by cusp. Yep, yep. So. Again, it looks like these health problems are significant and will persist and come to some sort of culmination by age 78. It's going to be an interesting Based archive, this video and this episode for in the next few years to maybe come yeah. back and watch this and, and, and see what maybe has, has transpired. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just looking at this if the fifth is his son, William, th then the eighth Uranus near the eighth cusp, mm -hmm. his eighth cusp, the 12th of the, of the figure, came to Pluto. This could be William's concerns about mortality, maybe worries about his wife, but I don't know. Interesting. In any case... I think, why don't we stop here? Because um, these are well, just points that have come up in the literature with directions and progressions, which are very slow moving uh, measures. Uh, it often comes up, what if it's a trine? Does that always mean something good? The answer is no. Mm. <laughs> that almost all astrologers have said that it really depends on the nature and condition of the planets involved. And uh, for instance, Davison writes it's soft, sextals, trines, aspects are generally viewed as fortunate and hard as unfortunate. But, and there may be a certain justification because those are favorable aspects in general. But what, but often they can indicate difficulties and hard aspects can indicate positive outcomes. This is by progression or direction. Mm. And that what really matters, the original state and condition of the planets, especially in the birth chart. Uh, and they hold a greater influence on the outcome than the nature of the aspect itself. Interesting. Okay, so that's it. Wonderful. Me... Well... Anthony, uh, again, I wasn't being hyperbolic at the beginning of this episode, how excited I was for such a, a wonderfully in-depth and just, just fascinating going through all the techniques. And of course, um, I've still got, got the book here. I implore everyone to, to get a copy. Not only that, just go through and take a bit of time. I'm, I'm not going to pretend I've mastered any of these uh, areas, but even to go through and look at your own life and your own chart and to apply some of these lesser known symbolic measures and as Anthony was talking about before combining not only the symbolic measures but the operative influence and the triggering events 
and um, it really is one of the most fascinating uh, books books I've read. So thank you, Anthony, so much. Well, you're welcome. And you know, Franklin, don't thank me. Thank Franklin. He Franklin, must well, have been a, a yeah. wonderful astrologer. I wish you were alive today. I would go see you in a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is what I love about um, doing episodes like this, bringing someone who was, was not well-known or lesser-known and bringing, you know, such great astrologers back to life, it seems. And to, so you've managed to be a conduit or... Uh, put all of these techniques together from his work and bring it back out into the public right now. So uh, it's absolutely uh, wonderful, wonderful job. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you all for watching. I know this is quite a long episode. How long we've gone on for? Nearly two hours. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, absolutely fascinating. Thank you all for watching. Again, to reiterate, uh, if you'd like to purchase Anthony's book, please see the uh, link in the description box and the comment box below. You can purchase the book there. And again, I highly, highly recommend reading reading it and applying some of the techniques to your own life. So thank you all for watching. And again, Anthony, thank you so much for your brilliant insights and one of the, my uh, most favorite presentations we've done on this series. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all for watching. Goodbye.